Welcome to another installment of How Should I Introduce You? I am Silas Grant, and uh, today is a bit different than normal. Typically, I would have uh, two guests on, and those two guests would be people that don't know each other, and it would be my job to introduce them and also facilitate a conversation to allow them to get to know each other. And um, uh, this week, uh, it's just me, and that is for two reasons. One, as I began to reflect on this concept, the one thing that came to my mind was that uh, I'd never shown people how I'd like to be introduced. And that was a thought that came to my mind a couple of times um, in between installments where I was just thinking about what would I do if someone asked me to introduce myself. And so that was one reason. The second reason is that, um, quite frankly, uh, I have a laundry list of people that I want to introduce. And uh, there were a couple of connections that I was trying to make happen for this week's episode or this week's installment, and they fell through. Uh, and so I didn't want to lose the momentum of having a week go by without an installment. And so it came back to me um, <clears throat> that thought of maybe you should allow the people that watch these installments, uh, give them an opportunity to um, hear from you directly in terms of how you would like to introduce yourself. And so um, I thought a bit about a short statement and uh, for the people who've been on these installments, I typically ask them to send me something via text, either bullet points or a uh, small text. So I decided to write a small text that I felt, at least in this moment, is the way in which I would like to be introduced. Uh, so for me, Silas Grant, I'm big on consideration, which means I'm often concerned about others. I'm developing my life uh, for it to be less about who I am and more about who I've been. Uh, relationships matter, but so do results. I love connecting people. I love seeing the development of people. I'm very opinionated, but not argumentative at all. People always tell me that I have great ideas. A big goal is for me is to develop teams to execute on those big ideas. By all means, I am a work in progress, making sure that I keep that progress. I'm a husband, father, friend, but as I've said before, everything that I say I am has to be reflected and what I've been. Uh, so I want to take a few moments to uh, expound on that brief bio. Uh, so for me, the first statement was I'm big on consideration. I'm really, really big on that. I love to make sure that I respect and honor anyone that I come in contact with. I try to give the benefit of the doubt to people. Uh, I try to make sure that I accommodate people and that I'm thinking ahead and thinking um, beyond the expectation. You know, I, I consider myself to be a servant in that way. So always uh, concerned about the well-being of others. Um, the next sentence that I put in the bio was, you know, I'm developing my life for it to be less about who I am and more about who I've been. And in my estimation, who you are is a reflection of how you feel about yourself. But who you've been is a reflection on how people see you and the impact you've had on other people. So I can create in my own heart and soul whatever I want to create uh, in terms of how I want to be seen. But that doesn't mean that I'm going to be seen that way. That's how I want to be seen. So um, in many instances, who you've been, that's not as uh, much of an argument. It's a flat out case. You know, people can see who you've been, they can see what you've done. Uh, and so I, I really wanna continue to develop to a point where it's less about who I am and, and what I've been. Um, relationships matter, but so do results. And what I mean by that is a lot of times we give friends, family, colleagues, space to um, fail us, to disappoint us, 
right? Um, we say it's okay a lot. We say don't worry about it a lot. And so when a person allows you to come up short or to fail them, a lot of it's because you and that person are both leaning on that relationship. Um, but the results matter as well. So, you know, I think relationships grow over time when um, people put a focus on results. I think results is what helps the relationship to grow to the point that it is. But the continuation of growth is about the continuation of results. So. Uh, it's not good enough to be nice to people. Uh, it's not good enough to be respectful or considerate of people. Uh, it's also important to bring about results. Um, for me, the, the next couple of sentences, and I, I love connecting people. I love seeing the development of people. It doesn't even have to be a situation where I'm involved in that development, but I just love to see people develop and grow. You know, that's important for me. Um, then I say I'm very opinionated, but not argumentative. I have an opinion on virtually everything. Whether it's important for me to express that or not, it's a different story, a different conversation. But you know, typically I take time and I think and reflect on most of the things that I process in my mind. Uh, but at the same time, I'm not trying to have arguments with people about what we feel about things that aren't important. And in most situations, most things are not very important. So it's not a uh, situation where I have to argue with people about the opinions that I have. I love letting people live and I, I want to be allowed to live as well. Um, people do tell me that I have great ideas, um, but I think the most important thing is to begin to execute on the ideas that are worthwhile and that doesn't happen alone. So you have to develop uh, groups and teams of people and um, the thoughts that I have in my mind, which I'm going to share a few of my ideas long term, um, hopefully on this installment. Um, but I, you know, I think teamwork is underrated. It's become cliche. It's become, you know, like a corny, um, a corny saying, right? Teamwork makes the dream work, but it's really true. Uh, you can't do everything alone and you can't try to house all of the work inside of you because you could potentially, uh, procrastinate and you could potentially try to execute on your own, but it may not be at the level of excellence that it should be. Um, you know, like most people, I, I call myself a work in progress, uh, but it's important to make sure that you keep the progress. Um, don't find yourself in a state of constant potential. You know, you want to make sure that there's actually progress that can be tracked. And that goes back to the difference between who I am and what I've been. You know, what can you lay out to say, this is where I was and now I'm progressing to a different level. Um, and then finally, for me as a husband, a father and a friend, you know, those are the roles that I play um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, I love being a husband, love being a father, love being a friend. And I really, really believe that in order to have friends, you must be a friend first. And I try to the best of my ability uh, to be a, a friend and a family member to those that I'm close to. So that's an explanation of the bio. Um, typically in these installments, family comes up. So I wanna explain a bit about my family background. Uh, my mom and dad have been married uh, in a few weeks, it'll be 59 years. Uh, my dad is 80, my mom is in her 70s. I have two older sisters. Uh, one of my sisters is married. They have children and grandchildren. My wife and I have been married for 10 years. We have a one-year-old daughter. Um, got nieces and nephews. Got a bunch of cousins. My mom and dad both have a lot of siblings uh, in the double digits on both sides. So, you know, I've got no shortage of dozens of first cousins and second cousins and third cousins. And my family uh, is predominantly from South Carolina. My mom and dad both come from uh, households where sharecropping was the way in which they fed the family. Um, as a result of sharecropping, the, the goal was to uh, collect and retrieve as much crop as possible. Uh, the crops included cotton and corn and um, you know other 
foods and goods that were um, in that area where they, you know, were were born and raised. And so my mom and dad, uh, because of the volume needed to make ends meet, um, they had to often skip school. And my dad ended up permanently dropping out of school in the second grade. So um, he did not get, you know, a formal education that was acceptable on any front. And um, he worked hard and um, he had a rough way to go, but he endured it. And um, his, his experiences helped shape who I am. My mom's the same thing. Um, she ended up completing school when they relocated to DC. And like many black people that came from sharecropping families, they migrated north to find better opportunities. They've been in DC since the 1960s. And my sisters and I benefited from their uh, matrimony and their commitment to one another. So they've been some really, really good examples to me of what it means to uh, be committed and to stick to your word and to stick to um, being hardworking and to live a highly moral and ethical life. Um, growing up in a household like mine with parents like mine, there were advantages, but also shortcomings. The advantages were that we had stability, we had faith, you know, growing up in a Christian household, uh, we held closely to Christian principles, uh, which include loving your brother man, giving of yourself to your brother man, um, sacrificing your desires uh, to be an example for those who may not have an example otherwise. And um, that was an advantage because discipline was, was laid out for us pretty early. And so um, I took on a lot of the uh, example that I saw from my parents around discipline and just being selfless. And much of that comes from, again, uh, the Christian upbringing. Um, but along with those advantages, which I think has given me an opportunity to be who I am, there's also shortcomings, right? Um, one of the things that I deal with in my adult life is trying to master confidence, uh, trying to master the idea that there's more out here for me to obtain. And my parents come from the South and they come from modest beginnings. And oftentimes their advice, whether it was verbally or um, inadvertently, they often pass down the advice of just staying out of people's way, get your small piece and stay to yourself. Um, but me coming along when I came along in the late 70s and 80s, and now into the 90s, 2000s, and you know, now we're in 2020, there's much more out here. And um, I think that family means well, right? Um, but oftentimes your family, they don't want you to take risks. They want you to just do the safest thing possible. And that's what parents are supposed to share with their children. So I'm thankful for a tribe of people beyond my, my immediate family who you know, often keep me motivated to go after more. Uh, and my family, I'm thankful for. Um, but I also understand that the more ambitious side of me is developing from my relationships with people beyond my immediate family. And my hope ultimately with, with those ambitious thoughts is to create a new legacy for my family moving forward. And uh, I don't regret anything about my childhood or my family and the sacrifices they made. Uh, but I also believe that in this time that we live in, there's so much information that uh, if you take advantage of the information and execute on it, that you can go beyond the idea of just taking your peace and staying out of people's way. So um, one other major advantage to my background is that my mom and dad have always been great givers. So those of you who know me know that I've been involved in community work for over 10 years, volunteering with nonprofit organizations, 
running for locally elected offices, holding locally elected offices, uh, and just doing things on a formal and informal basis to help other people. My mom and dad have always been that way. They've opened their houses, their house to people to, um, to come in and live. Um, they've taken money out of their pockets, time out of their day. Um, these are not one-off situations. My mom and dad have really walked some people through some really tough times. And so I saw early on um, the, the, ne the necessity for giving to uh, people that don't have as much as you have, that haven't been as blessed as you've been blessed. Um, so that was the, uh, the genesis of my community work. And uh, my work started when I got back from college. I went to Hampton University, came out in 2002, started dibbing and dabbing in volunteer work, maybe like my senior year, 2001 fall. And uh, when I got back home in 2002, I uh, began to just try to connect with people that were doing events that were helping people out. And then a few years later, I ended up taking on my own initiatives uh, and endeavors to uh, dig into local politics and also to dig into local civic work in my community. Uh, and I've been a part of too many initiatives to name at one time, but um, I've enjoyed it. It's become a part of the fabric of my life. And I just couldn't see myself um, not getting involved in activities that benefit other people. It's just a part of me. I can never go away from that. And so um, <clears throat> this concept of how should I introduce you is really an extension of some of that community work. Because in the course of me doing that work, I've met people that have come along and become like family to me. Um, college friends, childhood friends, friends from church, friends that I've met through social platforms. You know, we've developed this loose tribe of people that overlap. And what I found in the last 10 to 15 years is that I've been introducing people that um, have gone on to meet each other, grow their own relationship. And I've had some people that I've introduced that have actually done initiatives together people who've gone into business and been successful and made money together. And um, one of my mentors, may God rest his soul, I mean Muslim, passed away uh, about a year and a half ago. And um, I was at his service uh, and I looked around the uh, institution that we were at and I saw so many people in the room that he had introduced me to. And I thought to myself, like, when I die, I want people to say that I met some good people through him. I met some people that my life would otherwise be different had I not met them through him. And so I'm um, sitting in this religious institution where his burial services was happening and I'm saying to myself, man, like, I'm a better person because he introduced me to these people. These are people that I pick up the phone and ask requests of all the time, people who do the same to me. So we're all better people because we met, because he took the time to see the value in introducing us. So that was um, one of the things that, that caused me to think about doing this thing on a formal level of introducing people on a weekly basis. Um, also. I mean, told me many, many years ago that he felt that I should really put an effort into being in the thought leadership space. He felt that I had some thoughts and ideas that should be shared on a wider scale. And, um, you know, this, this vision for how should I introduce you and a few other things that I'll talk about in a few minutes um, are built around some of those conversations he and I had. And also um, during the pandemic, uh, we have not been able to get together, we as people. And I thought about what networking looks like in the future. And I'm not a big networker. I don't go to networking events, so to speak. But there are opportunities where networking happens at events. And I started thinking about how can I 
maximize my value by helping other people. And during the pandemic, we started seeing all these Zoom meetings for work and for, you know, for play. And I was thinking to myself, why not introduce people on Zoom, record it, put it on YouTube and let other people watch it as an experiment. And at the same time, many of you may be uh, aware of what's happening in the music industry now with the uh, sound clashes, so to speak, on Instagram, on the Versus channel. And that got me thinking about people coming together and meeting each other, not, in a, not for the sake of competition, but just putting two people in a room that don't know each other. And, um, you know, I'm a big podcast junkie and I watch podcasts um, that have a large variety of topics and um, themes. And um, one of the uh, podcasts that I check out from time to time is Drink Champs. And I saw a couple of episodes where guests that were featured were being interviewed and then suddenly another celebrity walked in that they had never met before. And I was saying to myself, man, that'd be great to see that as a real theme, bringing two people together that don't know each other. And so I kept thinking about the verses, the drink champs. I kept thinking about Amin telling me about being a visionary and a thought leader. Um, and I kept thinking about just what I already do as far as introducing people. And I said to myself, let's just do it. So I asked a couple of people to do it. And everyone that I shared the idea with, uh, they said, hey, I love it. I want to be a part of it. I want to help you. So my vision for this concept is to have great people meet each other. And while there are no strings attached, I want people's lives to be changed by the introductions that I'm making between them and other people. Once the pandemic is over, I, I do want to consider doing in-person events. I would love to do these installments ongoing, but at the end of this year, I would love to compile uh, portraits of each guest that I've had and to have a bio written under those portraits and to do an in-person event where I invite all the guests who've been on thus far and invite other people as well, just to celebrate um, the fact that people are meeting new people. Um, and then also bringing people together in an effort of connecting, networking, and potentially building relationships. I also, uh, some people may know this, but I do life skills training as well. I've not done as much of that lately, but um, I wanna take sort of the training element of my skill set and to develop a curriculum around relationship building. So I'm using these installments that I put together to showcase my ability to connect people and to train people on some of the tips that I've learned along the way. There are people who want to be connectors. There are people who want to uh, be at the center of their tribes and they want to be influencers. And that's not to say that I'm the expert on that, but I think I have some concepts that I can share with people. So using these installments as a way to promote the opportunity for me to do training around building relationships and how to attract people and how to be an influencer in the circles and tribes that we operate in. Um, so that's my vision for this concept. And, um, you know, a, a lofty goal, I would love to have a conversation with LinkedIn and, you know, provide this as some sort of function on there. Obviously, already, if you're on LinkedIn, you know, there are times where people jump in your inbox and say, hey, can you introduce me to X, Y, and Z? And it's sometimes awkward because that's not what, you know, your core skill is, right? Sometimes, you know, the whole reason why I do how should I introduce you? Well, not the whole reason, but one of the reasons why I do it is because I feel like people shortchange their friends. They sometimes um, believe that that person wants to be introduced in a certain way, and that's not the way they want to be introduced. So if you were to walk up to me and say, hey, I'm trying to get a job. I know you're friends with this guy on LinkedIn. Can you introduce me? What ammunition do I have? What's my first interpretation of what you've been? You know, what's my 
perception of you. If I had to put it on paper or if I had to verbally express a way to introduce you, how would I do that? Are you leading with the right way that you'd like to be introduced? Right? You may have a desire to be introduced one way, but you're not living that way so that a person who randomly knows you uh, couldn't on the spot introduce you correctly. So um, I would love, I, I haven't even thought all of it out, but I would love to have a conversation with LinkedIn. I mean, obviously I'm far away from being a partner with them right now, but I would love to share this concept and maybe build something out where on a professional level, people could take advantage of um, what I consider to be safe spaces to be able to introduce one another or, or introduce two people that they know or three people um, or whatever it may be. And, and for all I know, you know, I'm not a LinkedIn expert either. They may have a function that's similar to this, but all in all, I think people in this time that we're living in a pandemic, social unrest, uh, financial unrest, we're going to have to, in some ways, start from scratch. And sometimes the person that you're friends with, you may not know in the appropriate way. I mean, think about this. How many people that you know you hang out with and you don't know where they work or you know where they work, but you don't know their title. You don't know their passions. You don't know their intended purpose in life. Um, so I think this is a time that we're living in where you should be rethinking all of your relationships and what you should be doing with those relationships. How can you leverage those for your success and the success of the people that you're in those relationships with? So that's what my thoughts are around this concept is to formalize these informal relationships. Yeah, we're friends, yeah, we joke around, but why can't we develop together? What's stopping us from investing in each other in a real formalized way? We can still be cool, we can still laugh and joke, but there's nothing stopping us from being um, who we need to be for each other for the sake of development. Um, for those of you who know me, uh, you know that uh, I do writing on Instagram, on the Instagram stories, and I share personal stories and I try to add a lesson um, that people can take and live by at the end of the stories. And I'm in the process of writing a book now based on those Instagram stories. And so I'm verbalizing this publicly so that people can hold me accountable to get that book done, right? Uh, but that's another idea that I have. And, um, you know, I want it to be uh, spiritual, mental food for your soul. Um, I think that all of us have a lot more in us than we give to the world, including myself. And I'm writing about where I think I need to go. And those stories are predominantly for me as motivation, but I share them with the public. And so I motivate myself and I wanna be able to motivate others and provide people with content that they can use as fuel to be successful. So um, I think there's way, there are ways that I can web that concept into this one as well. And uh, as I think through those things, I'm looking to execute um, on the advancement of this concept along with writing uh, into uh, something that can be published and people can view and something that can have an impact on people for a long time. I've also made a commitment to read a book a week and I've done that since July of 2020. And I'm working now on a concept where people can read along with me if they choose to take on that challenge of reading a book a week. And I love to do a reading book club and i'd love to review those books online uh whether it's uh here on, uh, whether it's here on uh youtube uh zoom instagram I'm, I'm figuring that all out at this point but i just think that in order for us to be better people we've got to read more uh it's important to be passionate but it's also important to be informed and I love reading because when you read, it's someone that has taken the time to put together two to 300 pages 
of content. You can't write a book in one day. You can't just sit down and, you know, put together a concept in 30 minutes and complete it and write it the way that you would a tweet or a Facebook post or Instagram meme. So whenever you read a book, it's coming from a thoughtful space. Even if you don't agree with the person's perspective that is writing the book, you know that that person took time and time is important because that's an investment. So reading books for me is a transition that I'm making um, in terms of the intensity of the reading and uh, the frequency of it. Because we scroll on our phones all the time, but every tweet, every Facebook status you see, somebody's doing that off of an impulse. It may not even be based on information that they've read or that they've researched. Um, it's just sometimes anecdotal. It's an opinion. And as I said, I'm very opinionated, but I'm not argumentative. So I don't share all my opinions, but people do that online. And we scroll, 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 scroll. And the majority of what we process all day comes from people who have not thought out what they express. It's just an impulse expression of, the, of themselves. And then that influences how we respond because then we on an impulse basis either agree or disagree. So I want us to slow down and really take in more information that's been prepared. You know, no more microwave statements. I want us to get to a point where we are reading things that have taken more time to be put together, which means that the quality is at a higher level. Another idea that I have is um, I walk every day. I walk three miles on weekdays and I walk five miles on weekends. So. Monday through Friday, three miles a piece. Saturday, Sunday, five miles a piece. And this how should, I, how should I introduce you concept is me introducing two different people. But I also want to meet more people. And I want to do a concept where I'm walking and meeting people. Um, not along the walk I'm meeting them, but someone that I may be introduced to and it may be at an event, it may be in passing, someone makes an introduction in an effort for me, in an effort for me to get to know them. The first encounter that we have beyond that introduction, I want it to be a walk, like a walking meeting. And I would love to record that. I would love to get like a video team to record me meeting somebody while we, you know, do a three or four mile walk and just talk about each other and talk about how we operate, what our feelings and thoughts are. Um, because I think walking brings out a lot of great ideas. I think walking also pushes your mind in ways that if you were sitting across from someone in a coffee shop, it probably wouldn't be pushed that way. So uh, along with this, how should I introduce you concept? I want to also create a walking concept where I'm either meeting, I'm either having a first encounter with someone that I've been recently introduced to or catching up with somebody that I haven't talked to um, in long form with in a while. Um, so I'm thinking through that as well. Um, I got a couple of more ideas that I just wanted to put out there because I think putting things out there for accountability is important. Um, and I also think that sometimes we're afraid to share ideas because we think people will steal them. But I also think that people steal ideas because we don't work on them. So this is me saying to myself, you're saying it, now do it. So the next thing that I, you know, I've been working on is Bike in the City, D.C. There's a hashtag you can follow on Instagram, B-I-K-E-I-N-T-H-E-D-C. Um, T-H-E-C-I-T-Y-D-C, so Bike in the City, D.C. Um, I've done some stuff in New York, Philly, as well as Detroit and Austin, Texas. So you can look up Bike in the City, NYC, Bike in the City, Philly, Bike in the City, Detroit, and Bike in the City, Austin on Instagram for those hashtags. You may not find as much content on that one because I'm not in those cities every day, but I've been doing bike in the city for a number of years now, just an informal way of me photographing my bike rides. And um, my goal is to formalize that. I'm actually working on some uh, merchandise now, uh, bike related merchandise that people will uh, soon be able to purchase. And um, the pandemic has really increased ridership at least in DC, I know across this, across the country is probably the same thing, but 
uh, people are getting on bikes. They're starting to see the advantages of being on bikes and just the fun that it that it brings about when people get a chance to ride together. Um, and I'm working on training to do a 100 mile bike ride in September of 2021. So I've got a year to do that. And there are people who do 100 mile rides without all the training I'm trying to do, but I just want to make sure I do it the right way. And uh, I've been biking since I was a kid and uh, I never stopped. Most people stopped around post high school, college time. Um, one of my best friends that I grew up with also went to college with me and he had a bike on campus. So I've never gone like a whole year without riding bikes. Some point in the year, summertime, fall, spring, winter, been on a bike since I was a kid. I love it. It's, uh, it gives me a sense of freedom. It's relaxing. Uh, it's fun. You get to see things that uh, you don't see uh, in a car or on a train or bus. And I've also found that same sort of freedom with walking as well. So biking and walking have been great additions to my life, not just from a health perspective, but just from, well, not from a physical health perspective only, but from a mental health perspective. It just allows me to do things that um, expand my mind. Uh, lastly, I talked about uh, the consulting and training that I've done on the side in terms of workforce development and me building out curriculums around relationship building and networking as a goal. Um, and one of my professional mantras is to help leaders make better decisions. Um, anyone that knows me knows that typically I process and digest a lot of information throughout the day about a lot of different topics. And there are people that I work with and work around that are in leadership that I often help and I advise. And one of the advantages is that in certain areas, I typically have information a lot faster than other people because I'm exposed to a lot of different websites and different um, content outlets. So I see things and I try to share them with people in an appropriate way. When I get to meet people, I'm really, really interested in figuring out what your interests are. And if you're a friend of mine and I care about you and I feel like this content is for you, it's not out of the ordinary for me to shoot you a text and say, hey, look at this, check this out. Um, so that's me. I often do that. And, um, you know, my, my goal with consultation and training is to teach people, you know, how to build relationships, how to assist other people in leadership in that same way, but then also um, how to connect leaders to communities and how to get leaders to understand the importance of engagement um, in the communities that they serve, whether it be a physical community, a virtual community, um, a nuanced community, uh, just connections with people and building relationships. That sort of consultation training space is what I want to be in as well. As I mentioned, my mentor, um, may God bless his soul, um, one of my mentors, um, he talked about thought leadership a lot. And I wanted to share some of the people that um, are big influences on my life, people that I don't know, but people that I watch and observe a lot. Um, the first person is Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss is uh, an author, and he's mostly known for the Four Hour Work Week book. Uh, he's written maybe four or five books. That's actually not one of the books that I've read. I've read Tribe of Tribes, um, and um, uh. The book on mentors it's escaping me right now but those are the two books um that i've that i've read and um he is a person that does a lot of experiments and he also has relationships that allow him to talk to people who are the best at what they do so he has a podcast um that um features people that are typically uh, in the top spot in their respective industries. And he teases out tips and strategies from them. Uh, he also has a newsletter website and um, he's a big influence because 
he's worked into a space where he attracts the best of the best. And that's something that I would like to do um, in my travels in this media slash um, relationship networking sort of space that I'm entering is to be a person that can attract the best of the best and then help those people be even better by introducing them to other people. And um, just being a person who can serve as the glue. Um, the next person is Shane Parrish. Shane Parrish, out of all the names that I named, he'll probably be the least known. Um, but he has a blog co called Farnham Street. And Farnham Street is named after Warren Buffett's house, that he, the street that he lives on. And uh, Farnham Street, if I had to describe it, uh, it is one of the most detailed personal development, professional development websites. There's a bunch of articles on professional development, just how to be better in life. They give a lot of tips, a lot of hacks, but not just quick tips or like blog entries. They really go into deep research about theories around professional, professional development. So Shane Parrish runs that site. He has a paid feature for that site. And um, there's a couple of articles referring to the fact that some of the biggest people in finance, Wall Street, um, some of the biggest people in other industries subscribe. And it was kind of an underground movement where people that worked on Wall Street were sharing his articles um, and people live and die by those articles and they take those concepts and theories and apply them and they become even more successful. And um, he doesn't reveal much about the revenue that he gets from those paid sites, from that paid site. But um, um, his inspiration on me has been the fact that I have a blog, theinformationage.co. And um, I would love to get the site to a point where it's comparable to what Shane has going on. It takes a lot of work, years of work to get there, but um, you can check out his site, Farnham Street, um, and that's F-A-R-N-A-M-S-T-R-E-E-T. Um, and you look that up, Farnham Street blog, you'll see um, the, the content and how detailed it is and, and you can benefit from it. Um, next person is Grant Cardone. And a lot of you, if you watch YouTube, I'm a big YouTube fanatic. Now, YouTube is typically what I watch for entertainment. Grant Cardone is all over YouTube. In fact, he has a book that I read called The 10X Rule, where he states it's not about competition, it's about domination. And domination means that you've got to be everywhere all the time, or at least in the spaces you want to be. If you want to be in a space, you've got to be there um, the entire time. And it's not about trying to be better than the next person. It's about being ultimately the best that you can be and that's by being present and so he um makes a lot of money but he gives away a lot of free content and the free content that he gives away is in an effort to keep himself relevant which allows him to be dominant he's inspirational because um he's just always his motor's always going and um it's easy to tire yourself out when you don't have the confidence you should have to uh, do the things you need to do, but he's been an inspiration for me. Joe Rogan, um, the Joe Rogan experience, he's inspirational. Some people would call him controversial because of his political stances or just his, his disposition. I don't know if that's the right word, but like some people just look at him as a controversial figure. But one thing I, I like about Joe Rogan, and I don't watch all of the episodes because they tend to be two, three hours long, um, but what I like about him is that he's very curious. He just, he really digs into the, the topic at hand and the guest that's in the room and his conversations go very, very deep. And he seems to be a student of the people that are sitting across from him, which is what caused me to put him on this list of people that influence me. Um, as I do these installments, I realize that it's important to, um, it is important to have an interest in people that you're interviewing. 
And you can't just ask surface questions. You got to dig deep and do research before you get them across from you. But then also you have to listen during the interview. I mean, I've had times where I've done these installments and we go in a totally different direction just because I was able to listen to a person say something that I didn't expect them to say. And it caused us to go into a, a, a direction that made the interview even better. So I think Joe does a good job of that. Seth Golden is another person, um, a very bright mind, has published endless books. Um, he is uh, he is uh, the author of several books that have influenced people. I think one's The Purple Cow. Uh, another one is Lynchpin. Um, it's hard to even describe exactly who he is, but he's just his his ability to think about what the world looks like, what it should look like, and what it's going to look like. Um, he does a great job at that. So that's one of the reasons why he's you know one of the people who has who has influenced me um, in this thought leadership space. The next two people I'm looping or lumping together, but really out of respect, they shouldn't be lumped together. But I'm gonna do it in the interest of time, Jim Rome and Zig Ziglar. Um, Zig Ziglar is considered widely to be the godfather of personal development and motivation in terms of speeches and um, the concept of training people on personal development. He has an eight hour clip on YouTube that in the months of July, August, and September of 2019, when I first started walking on a daily basis, I listened to that clip over and over. I have YouTube read, I subscribe to YouTube. So when you have that edition, it holds the time mark when you finish and you X out of a video. So you can go back and go pick up right where it left off. And so my walks are typically about an hour. So those eight hours, like over the course of a week, a little longer than a week, I would listen to an hour of it each day. And his, his ability to change your mindset from a pessimistic one to an optimistic one is impeccable, is unmatched. He uses humor and basic stories to get people uh, up and going. And Jim Rome is the same thing. Same thing. Um, uh, Jim Rohn is, um, he, he, he has a little more, his stories are a little more formalized than Zig's. Zig re relies a lot on humor. Jim Rohn, Jim Rohn does as well, but um, he digs a little deeper um, on a formalized way than Zig, or at least based on the content I've been exposed to from the both of them. Uh, but he's also an early influencer in that personal development space. And I listen to a lot of his stuff as well. Uh, the last two are Les Brown and Eric Thomas. Um, Les Brown, when I was a kid, I used to think that motivational speaking was a joke growing up. I thought those people were scammers. I thought Tony Robbins and Les Brown were like the biggest scams in the world. I used to watch a lot of wrestling growing up and um, a lot of college football. Um, college football, wrestling, um, and cartoons on Saturdays. And so sometimes you would see Tony Robbins come on after wrestling or Les Brown come on after wrestling or football went off. And I just thought that it was a joke. Um, and so as an adult into my thirties and now in my forties, I'm really understanding that Les is the real deal. Um, he said something one day that really stood out to me. He said the difference between me and preachers is that they preach about the life of Jesus um, or believing in Jesus. He teaches about the things that Jesus did. And it doesn't sound like there's much of a difference, but when you listen to him explain it, you know, he talks about the difference between praising Jesus and actually living the life that he lived. And when he said that, it, it struck something inside of me about just being practical and modeling your life after great people. 
And um, he said some other things that, you know, I've found to be true. Um, and I really, really think that his personal story, as well as his way of delivering the message, has been an influence that's positive on me and continues to motivate me to continue doing what I'm doing. Lastly is Eric Thomas. Um, people know him as the very energetic person, the hip hop preacher. Um, at first I thought it was just a lot of noise, uh, but I've started to listen to him and how he's developed his team. And I talked about that in my bio, you know, having great ideas is important, but you've got to develop teams. And I, I've seen him do the personalysis stuff where it's called a disc assessment, D-I-S-C. And each of those letters represent a different personality. Um, so he's gotten into a place where he's not just coming in rooms and yelling at people to get them motivated. He's actually helping people identify their strengths and weaknesses. And he has a team of people that are helping him gain clients and get in front of new people. And, um, you know, he says some really influential things in his content that I've taken and really try to adhere to and apply in my life. So um, Tim Ferriss, Shane Parrish, uh, Grant Cardone, Joe Rogan, Seth Golden, Jim Rohn, Zig Ziglar, Les Brown, Eric Thomas, you know, very influential in my life in terms of the thought leadership space and where I want to go with that. Um, I also mentioned the word tribe earlier in, in me talking to you guys and or, you know, let me say this also, talking to a screen for an hour is odd for me with nobody talking back. So this is a real odd thing for me. I shared some things thus far that I didn't think I would share, but here we are, right? Um, but if you're watching this, I look at you as a member of my tribe and I'm a member of your tribe. And I think there's certain people that want this content. There's certain people that want to develop and you know, when I name those people, but all but two are not black. And I'm not trying to make this a black thing, but I also think that people are often attracted or more attracted to opportunities when they see people like themselves in the space. And I don't know that there are enough black people in the personal development and training space. There are not enough people that are focused, um, that, have been ex that have been publicly exposed for being focused on developing their tribes into a greater group of people. And all of the tribes that I belong to, all the ones that overlap, um, I want to be the glue. I want to be one of the people that can provide information, inspiration, motivation, um, and thoughts and ideas to help all of us be better. I just think that we're in a time now where money is different, work is different, family is different, everything's different. We have a chance to, if you're behind, you have a chance to play on an even field now because everybody's inconvenienced by the pandemic and also the social unrest and all that we're seeing politically. It's a new world that we're living in. And um, we have a choice now to pick the people we want to be around. And we should try to be around people that are keeping us on our toes and keeping us motivated. So um, I use the word tribe a lot. And when I say tribe, it's just the people that you pick to be around that you're moving with. And those people typically have a common belief system, a common way of executing, um, and a common level of success. And you are only going to go as far as the people around you go. If you cannot change your friends, you must change your friends. So we have a chance now to pick the people that we want to go into the next phase of life with. And I hope that people that are interested in this concept of how should I introduce you will watch it and will be inspired by it and will go back to their own tribes and reintroduce themselves to people and be introduced to people again because a lot of us need to do that. We know too many people that we don't know anything about. And all we do is sit around and have fun with them, but we don't know their aspirations or their dreams. So in order to build a tribe, we gotta build a belief system and we have to believe in each other, but we have to also believe 
that there's something greater than us as a tribe that we have to push toward. Um, there's a book that I read recently, um, and it's called When by Daniel Pink. And he talks about this group of people in India. So in India, um, the, the larger cultural standard is that people eat from home in many instances, but sometimes people can't prepare their food ahead of time for work. And so the people in the house who stay home will make the lunch for the people going to work. And I can't recall the name of this group, but they're these people who wear like white shirts and white hats. They pick up the food from the houses and they take them to the places where people work. And they deliver like 200,000 meals a day. It's a large group of these people. And um, Daniel Pink talks about synchronizing as a tribe. And he, he considers these delivery people as a tribe. And um, one of the things that he said is that you have to be motivated by something um, that's exterior to you. So for the people who make the deliveries, they are motivated partially by the fact that they have to have the food delivered at a certain time. So the clock is that exterior thing, right? But then he also says that the, the, the group that is attempting to synchronize, there has to be some sort of common belief system. There has to be something that they have that they are motivated by to do whatever work that has to be done. Um, and so it's not just fighting against the clock in this example. It's about the concept that they're doing something that's good for families. They're keeping people healthy by being able to deliver food that was made at home. Um, and they give people an opportunity to um, have food delivered without them having to spend money, having to eat unhealthy food, um, and they still are able to bring food that was made from the heart to people that are working on behalf of the people who are able to stay home. Um, so when I think about the tribe that we're in, what are we doing to benefit each other? What are we doing to provide um, a sense of um, love, respect, uh, consistency, and consideration um, for each other? You know, for me, my bio, again, I'm big on consideration which means I'm often concerned about others. Who are you concerned about? Um, and are those, are those people concerned about you? And if that is the case, then you get an idea for who your tribe is. Um, so I'm coming toward the end of this thing. And um, I wanted to, again, in, a, in, a, in the spirit of transparency, talk a little bit about what I do well and also the areas that I'm working on. So the things that I think I, you know, do pretty well, I'm a very respectful person. I uh, try to be as considerate as possible. Um, I try to anticipate the needs of other people. So that service piece is something I do really well. Yeah, I'm also, you know, I talked a little bit about advising leaders. And I think one of the things that I do well, and again, this may be the difference between who I am and what I've been, um, if, if you ask me, uh, I feel like who I am is a person who's, again, considerate and, you know, I have a skill of, of, of tweaking ideas and language. Um, but maybe if you ask somebody what I've been, it might be a little different. But nonetheless, um, when it comes to advising people in leadership and advising people making decisions, I feel like I have the real good skill at tweaking language. I feel like I have an understanding of how words are received by people and words are important. Um, changing words within a text or a speech um, or statement can help uh, get a message across a lot better. Tweaking an idea and adding a component to it or extracting one away from it can make, a, make or break the acceptance of the idea. So being considerate, being respectful, and also messaging. Um, those are areas where I think I'm really, really uh, skillful in. Um, this year, I've really been trying to work a lot on what I do with my time, the decisions I make, and how do I respond when I have options. Um, we don't have a lot of time, period. No matter how old you are, how young you are, time flies. And uh, the longer it takes for you to decide on something, the less time you have to actually work and execute. So I've been working a lot on just how can I get more done in a short period of time? 
um, decisions. How can I make decisions faster? I heard Grant Cardone say something. He was like, no great person has ever moved slow. Gandhi, Dr. King, Malcolm X, who you name it. You know, he named a bunch of people, Michael Jordan, Muhammad Ali. They move fast. They make decisions fast. They make mistakes fast. They make corrections fast. So again, going back to time and decisions, that's how those two things come into play and how they play into one another. And then also, what do you do when you have options? Um, sometimes when there's not a lot of time left and you've got something to do, you know how to focus there. But when you have time on your hands, how do you focus? How do you focus when there are options where all of them could potentially lead you in the right direction? How do you make the, uh, the differentiating, how do those things differentiate in your mind? How do you make the, 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 uh, the, the decision um, or, you know, how do you select the option? You know, so time, decisions, and options are things that I'm mindful of and I try to observe and, and, and uh, assess um, in my life. Um, so I've been talking now for like an hour, man. But the thing I want to end on, um, back in February of this year, randomly, I was just typing some notes on my phone and I try to journal sometimes. And I have this mantra or this affirmation, I should say, that I wrote in February. And I don't think I looked at that thing one time. I just typed it in that day. And a few days ago, I found it in my phone, uh, literally seven months later. And I feel like it captures everything that I need to think and say and live by. Um, and I've since screenshotted it and put it in my phone and I try to read it every day. So I'm going to read this and I think this is a good way to end it out. Uh, so the affirmation was written on February 2nd, 2020. And it says, I am worthy. I have value. Things change for the worse when I don't step up. I cannot be lazy. I cannot be stagnant. I have to be a champion. I have to bring all of me to all of what I do. I have to be great at what matters. I cannot misplace my gifts, talents, and abilities. I will be in a great mental space. It is meant for me to work to get what I want. I want all that comes along with being a success. The hardships make me better. The hardships destroy the old me. The old me would never be ready for the new life of success. If it doesn't bring the best out of me, that means the best wasn't in me. Therefore, I need to consume what will put me in my best mode. Sleep will not defeat me. It is meant to help me. Fear is a part of life. It will not destroy my opportunities. I will overcome fears. Stagnation or fear are not my destinies. I will always make a valiant attempt at what I pursue. I will not stand still. I will be a champion for my family. Amen. So that affirmation um, I wrote randomly i can't even recall what was going on at that time why i wrote that um but i do just want to highlight a few things that are inside that affirmation that stand out for me uh, one of the biggest things is that things change for the worse when i don't step up meaning that i have a purpose i have value it's meant for me to be involved in everything that i'm involved in sometimes we sit on the sideline and we watch things unravel when we could easily step in and help, but it's a matter of rolling our sleeves up and not afraid, not being afraid of getting our hands dirty. Um, the other thing that stands out, I cannot misplace my gifts, talents, and abilities. Using what has been given to me um, for the appropriate things is important. The hardships make me better. The hardships destroy the old me. The old me would never be ready for the new life of success. Every time you go through hardships, um, it doesn't always make you better, right? You have to choose to be better because of those, those hardships. And those hardships make you a better version of yourself, a newer version. And the old version can't take the success that you're embarking upon. You gotta become a new person to be able to handle the new life that comes along with success. And then I say, you know, if it doesn't bring out the best in me, that means the best wasn't in me. Therefore, I need to consume what will put me in the best mode. 
So when situations don't bring the best out of you, it's because the best is not in you. So you got to continue reading the right things and talking to the right people and reading the right affirmations and believing the right things. And so those things that you end up consuming then add to who you are and then they can be brought out in the next situation so that you can bring out the best of you in that next situation that's presented to you. Um, stagnation or fears are not my destinies. Stagnation happens, fear happens, but it's not the end. You can't treat it like it's the end. You got to get up when you feel like you want to stand still. You got to be a champion. You got to understand your worth. You got to understand your value. Um, some people might look at this video and laugh, right? But I know why I'm doing the video and that's all that's important. Some people may not understand now, but they may end up understanding later or they may not ever understand, but I understand. So it's important to reiterate to yourself um, who you are, what you believe, what you are looking to accomplish. Um, and so that's me. That's how I would like to be introduced. And um, I'm thankful for everyone that has watched this installment. Um, what would have been otherwise, in my opinion, an unproductive week by not having guests on here has allowed me to share with you all for about an hour who I am. And I hope that um, those who know me get a chance to know me in a different way through this. And those who don't know me at all get a chance to know who I am. So until the next time, I'll see you guys around. God bless.